So, quick show of hands. How many people here have ever been pulled over by the police? <laughs> what were some of your first thoughts? Oh, shit. Uh, sure. Rachel, go ahead. Um, I'm going to jail. Okay, I'm going to jail. Expensive. Oh, oh yeah. what else? Defensive route. Get mad at them. So, I want you to imagine <clears throat> that the first thing you think when you get pulled over is I hope I don't get shot. Because for a a significant portion of our country's population, that is the thought process. It's not what did I do, because they know they didn't do anything. It's not, man, this is gonna be expensive, because that's a given. It is, I hope I don't get shot. Um, and the fact that we all in this room have this different perspective of it is a type of privilege. Not one that we want, not one that we earn, but one that we all have. <clears throat> so somebody look at this and tell me, 102 in 2015, what, what does that mean? What, what, any guesses what that's, what's that number is about? Yes. How many people were killed by police? That, that's part of it. A little bit more specific. That is the number of unarmed persons of color shot by law enforcement officers in 2015. 102. And you know what the number nine is? How many were killed? No, I think they were mostly all killed. That's, oh, the, yeah, the, the, that's all lethal, is 102 were killed. Well, I, don't, I don't know what the total is for people who were shot. Uh, number of Caucasians shot? No, no, that's the number of uh, mm -hmm. times the that the case went to court. Oh, the criminal oh charges. God. We're shooting an unarmed person. Um, and whenever you talk about this, <clears throat> People, and I understand that law enforcement is, is a difficult job, um, but at the same time, it, it's the job that, that the person signed up for. And it's not nearly as dangerous as we make it out to be. Never, and there's a lot of risks that are involved. It's different than, you know, <clears throat> working at Old Navy or, or having a paper route. But the reality is, you know, these people kind of choose this life. and and. A lot of it, I think, comes down to structural inequality. <clears throat> the idea that, um, you know, because people always try to, to frame it or justify it, that we know it's a cultural thing. What does that even mean? Because here's my question. With stats like this, and the stats keep going, you know, a uh, number of uh, persons of color who are arrested are disproportionately affected compared to, to white people. If, if you follow all the way down the line, there's really only two options. Either one. Um, African Americans in particular are just more likely to commit crime and to be arrested and to do these things than white people, or there is something within the system, a structural inequality that has tilted the odds against them and made them a target. And I'm not saying this is purposeful. You know, law enforcement officers are, are trained. I think the vast majority of them get into it for the right reason. Uh, I interviewed uh, a captain with CMPD when I was collecting information for this, and he was very helpful. Um, he uh, was the person who led the crisis intervention trip team training, which is what they developed that based on the Memphis model, basically works with um, uh, increasing awareness of mental illness. Because um, that's something I was looking at for an intervention. But it didn't quite hit all the high points. Not saying that we need something more punitive, but we need something that holds people slightly more accountable. Because at the rate, um, at the rate people are getting shot um, without justifiable means, uh, there, there has to be some sort of stronger medicine. So in uh, training for uh, law enforcement, they, most people, most agencies, because it's all independent, there's no federal oversight, just to put that out there, use what's called the deadly force triangle. Um, you have to have a, um, the suspect has to have the opportunity and the ability to cause great bodily harm. That means that, the, that they have to have a clear target and they have to have a means to engage. And then the, the third piece is that they also have to uh, pose an imminent danger. So that means that they actually have to have agency 
directed at the officer, or, or, or towards a, a non-officer, like towards anyone in the community, obviously. But the number of shootings where this criteria isn't met is staggered. Um, and I think it really comes down to the fact that, that not enough attention is being paid <coughs> to this in training. 83% um, of police academies offer eight hours of instruction on mediation and uh, conflict management. 64% of police academies offer eight hours in problem solving. This is compared to 90 hours in firearms training, like just to put that in scale. And <clears throat> I'm not saying that you shouldn't know how to use a weapon if you're in law enforcement, but you should also know how to de-escalate situations. And I think the problem is um, between the difference in pay and the, uh, the need for officers, they're pushing people into positions that where they're not prepared. And, and every time you look, and not every time, but often when you look at what's happened in these officer involved shootings, you have someone who either has an established record of negligence or misconduct. And it usually starts off small. Uh, excessive use of force complaint, um, a suspicion of profiling in the way they're doing traffic stops. These are all indicators that are very strong predictors that somebody will be involved in one of these, what they call bad shootings. And I don't think it's purposeful. Uh, there's a part of me, I think it's the social worker in me, that, that has to believe that some part of this is just a, an implicit bias. Not being racist on purpose, but um, you know, having a misperception of what the risk is. You know, when, when you have a, a completely naked, obviously mentally ill individual, and, and you shoot them because you feel threatened, um, I think that goes beyond racism. I think that goes to something more primal, more, more elemental inside of someone. So maybe better screening is the option. But what I was looking at as far as uh, the theory behind <clears throat> this problem in this population is social learning theory. And, and what I kind of did is I drilled down and I looked at law enforcement officers as a subculture because that's the population I have to serve. And I want to look at their strengths and weaknesses. Now, law Enforcement officers are very often disciplined. A lot of them have military background. And a lot of them get into this because they have a duty to serve, a drive, like most of us, to serve. Yet, ironically enough, we end up on different sides of the same point so many times. You know, there's this combative relationship. And it's the perception, I think, that law enforcement officers have that social workers are always trying to get people off and get people over. And then we have the flip side where it seems like they're always coming through just cracking head and not asking questions. But I think somewhere in the middle, um, away from the polemics, there, there's a common thread. And, and that's sort of what I want to draw on. And, and, and when we look at social learning theory and how it applies to this subpopulation, we have differential association. And that basically means an individual is more likely to replicate behavior that they see modeled in their peers. So if you have one officer who's doing the right thing, making the good calls, following protocol, um, other officers are more likely to, um, to, to, to get into that, to do that same sort of thing. Another important piece is definitions. These definitions are specific and local to the agency and to the subculture. And law enforcement has its own vernacular that, that's a lot different than what we in social work use. And, uh, and I think it's important that we um, respect that, and, and in a sense, try to seek to understand it. Because coming at it and bringing our own perspective isn't working. It, it causes people to be defensive, it causes people to be resistant. And that's what I kept coming across in my research, is that if you come in to a tight-knit group and start trying to lay down the law, you're gonna meet a lot of resistance, and you're not gonna get any connection. There'll be no traction. So what I'm looking at is early intervention systems. And what this basically is, is it's sort of a, a twist on the technological approach. People always talk about body cams and, and less lethal means. This is more of an infrastructure measure, but it still is technology. What it is, is it's a sophisticated uh, computer system that tracks and monitors uh, police activity. And what you do is you set uh, performance indicators. And this is key, because the performance indicators and how they're processed or analyzed determine why a person gets flagged or not. So, basically all the officers are entered into the system and the frontline supervisor 
um, is the person who manages the system. So let's say I have a beat and Emma has a beat. And I pull over 100 cars in one year, and I get one complaint of force. Emma pulls over 10 cars and gets two complaints of force. Okay, well obviously, when you look at that in relation, Emma has a much higher use of force. And, and that's uh, one way that we set these performance indicators. And that's why having, um, kind of from the top down, proper management and implementation is so important because these, this system has actually been used. Um, the Department of Justice and a lot of its arbitration agreements, whenever they settle uh, situations between uh, local municipalities and families of victims of you know, shootings, um, have put this system in place. The biggest criticism is that it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work, and this is something that the research proves out, <clears throat> is that the performance indicators are picked haphazardly, and it's not monitored closely. And worst of all, when, when, when a performance indicator is selected and a threshold is hit, instead of going to the review and intervention piece where we look at your record, we bring you in, we, we suggest an intervention, we say, okay, well, apparently you're having a hard time with the proper way to arrest people, so you're gonna have to review that part of your training. Um, but instead of doing that, we have these frontline supervisors who are just like, well, you know how it is down there, we gotta, things get rough, he's, he's overworked. And they wave them through. And then down the line, these are the same cops who end up on the front page. So the intervention and monitoring part uh, is what's most important in this, for proper execution. And, and what they found is that if it is implemented properly and monitored correctly, because once you get on the radar with this system, you stay on the radar um, for at least a year after you've been flagged and intervening on. So this is a pretty, pretty strong evidence-based model. Um, and again, it is a technology approach, and there would need to be further training and education with it. But this at least holds people accountable. You know, it's like that old saying, who watches the watchers? You know, we need to have some sort of oversight where people aren't afraid to do their job, but they are conscientious of, of the consequences and the lives that they're going to impact if they're not careful. And that's basically what I'm talking about here is uh, standardization across um, all departments. What I envision for implementation would be a federal program that would put two social workers and all major municipal police departments across the country. Um, we could even do a pilot where we maybe do five agencies at a time in a six month rotation. And the trick is to approach law enforcement officers like any other um, subculture and develop a cultural competency where the social worker almost forms an alliance and treats them with dignity and respect. Because I think, I think a lot of what causes resistance, and this is just from talking to people I know who are in law enforcement, is they feel like they're always being put upon. You know, They feel like they're being targeted. They feel like everyone's looking for a reason to run them down when they're just out here trying to do something good. Does this sound familiar to anyone in here? <laughs> How ironic, right? That like we have all that in common, but time and time again, in front of judges, in front of hearings, and on the street, we end up on different sides of the same stick. So the idea would be to embed social workers in the police department. This would be 40 hour a week positions plus. And they would have a dual role. One would be training frontline supervisors to manage the system. You know, like we're saying, without proper oversight, it, it just it doesn't work. And the other would be to help um, increase the level of understanding and empathy among the officers. Now this could look like ride-alongs, this could look like spending time with precinct, but basically <clears throat> working together to kind of frame this in a way where, where, where law enforcement officers say, we're not coming down on you. We're trying to make everyone safe. We know you want to keep yourself safe. And we know you want to keep the citizens safe. But just maybe, just maybe, this is implicit bias. And I think that that might work better than the you know, four hour a year mandatory you know, diversity training or cultural sensitivity training, which the cops frankly scoff at. And the reason they scoff at it is because the majority of the people they come into contact with a lot of times can be dangerous. And they make a lot of assumptions that they shouldn't make. And the only way we know this to change people's assumptions is to challenge them 
to give them other examples of what people are actually like. You can't, you can't come in and, and start telling people top down, you know, you should think about things this way. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the, the framework. And there's a lot of other stuff. I mean, when it comes into um, structural inequality and white privilege, uh, a lot of people, like we were saying earlier, talk about the idea that, um, well, you know, it's cultural. There must be, you know, and, and like I was saying earlier, it, it's really not, because if you look at it, in 2009, uh, in Texas, they did a study that looked at seventh graders between the years of uh, 2000, 2001, 2002. It's over a million students. And in the Texas school system, there are two types of uh, offenses. One of those requires mandatory police involvement, and one of those is left up to the discretion of the administrator or teacher. Now, when it came to infractions that require mandatory police intervention, persons of color and Caucasians are equally represented. They're neck and neck. But when it's left up to the discretion of the administrator or the teacher, persons of color are represented much more highly than white people. And the list goes on. In 2012, the Department of Housing and uh, Urban Family, uh, or Department of Housing and something, Urban Affairs, uh, did a, uh, a study where they took uh, families that were comprised of persons of color and families that were Caucasian. They gave them the same or similar credit histories, similar employment histories, similar income, and sent them into real estate agencies and asked to be shown houses. And they were shown literally different properties in different neighborhoods with the exact same paperwork. All they really did was change the name. And, and the, the families of color were shown houses in neighborhoods with lower performing schools, fewer grocery stores, and higher rates of crime. So it's there. Like this, this structural inequality that, that causes this differential is there. And, um, and you can't really take it away. You, you can try to minimize it, you can try to work around it, but it's a driving force in, in what causes you know, this perception in law enforcement. And that, that's kind of the idea with this uh, early intervention program is that it would address 